I started uh, many, 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 many years ago, almost as soon as I went out of a master's degree in 1970, asking myself, what is the connection between cybernetics and law, given that both of these deal with behavior, both deal with control. And it's been a very, very <clears throat> long journey. Uh, eventually, I got to meet uh, Stafford Beer. This is in 1981. We were both young, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but this is us 30 pounds later. Uh, well, and, uh, and Stafford's uh, teachings were very surprising and very uh, illuminating because it turned out that his model, the viable system model, uh, matches the organization of the state just uh, perfectly. It's a, it's a perfect match. I, we were, he, he came to Mexico, we were trying to convince the Mexican government to apply some of his cybernetics management to the government. <coughs> We never managed to get them to do anything, but uh, it was uh, a way I, I, could I talk to Stafford. And we were in Querétaro having a, like a weekend off our regular time. And I asked them, if you say the viable system model will map many organizations, all types of viable organizations, does it apply to the state? I said, yes. He said, very confident, yes. Well, being an attorney in Mexico, I know that our Constitution is exactly a map of the state. It tells, it says how to organize the Mexican state. So that means that you're saying that if I look for the VSM, in the Mexican Constitution, I will find it there. And he was also very confident, saying yes. And I said, I read it so many times, and I, I'm not so sure. So I, I went and got myself a Constitution, and started reading it, the same thing I've read many times, with another filter, another viewpoint in my mind. And surely enough, surely enough, I found that all the Constitution was a description of a viable system model in the terms described by Stafford. It was quite uh, surprising, and it was exhilarating, and I knew that perhaps we hit something big. Because he was sure of his theory, but he never applied it concretely to the state as such. So today I want to thank many of the cyberneticians that had something to do with me being here and you being here and this connection. Uh, on the left, uh, on top left, is Arturo Rosenbluth. He uh, convinced Norbert Wiener the mathematician from MIT, that uh, cybernetics was a connection based on um, the connection of cybernetics with, with the real world, with the animal world, with the mechanical world, was the, the notion of feedback. They later organized the Macy Foundation meetings where lots of scientists got together. And eventually, uh, cybernetics became a scientific paradigm which encompasses much more than just the mechanical things uh, of control. It's, it's, a, it's a way of doing science, it's a way of looking at the world. On the bottom left is Ross Ashby. He wrote Introduction to Cybernetics. To his right is uh, Heinz von Forster, who I met uh, at one event of the American Society of Cybernetics, and of course, Stafford I am here at a later date. And uh, they put all the scientific foundation for the things that I'm, I'm going to say today. Uh, Stafford took it all 
and then put it into the viable system model and this management cybernetics. And I'm going to show you how it all connects together. Here I have an illustration of Ptolemy in ancient Greece. He put together a, a, a model of the universe with the, with the uh, Earth in the center. And law, which is related to the state, has been accused of being a Ptolemaic or Ptolemistic or how would you say it? A science in the sense that it, it connects with no other science. It, it's been considered a science for a long time uh, that is very difficult to pin down. The, in the universities, at least in the United States, law schools will have their own libraries, distinct from the rest of the university. It's a, it's a different world. And the regular science uh, bodies could not relate to what lawyers were, were doing. And I think that the reason is that lawyers were doing cybernetics without them knowing that it was cybernetics. And this is something that I will show to you. It, it, it's going to become sort of obvious. Through trial and error, attorneys uh, put together systems of government that the bottom line is they are cybernetic contraptions. And I'll show you show that to you. And this is the reason why people could just not connect to the to the legal system. Okay. And and, and lawyers have a very uh, separate language from the rest of science. The technology that was in use when the founding fathers of the United States decided, designed the U.S. Constitution uh, was just a pen and, and paper and a horse carriage. That, that was the fastest you could communicate anything, okay? Now we have all these new technologies. So I say maybe we are reaching the point where we can create a cybernetic state using cybernetic principles, which the founding fathers of the United States, for instance, could just sort of guess at, but they, they, they didn't have all the fundamentals. Now, the, I'm, I'm going to give you a very fast description of what the viable system model is. The Stafford says that there's an environment, which is this, that has an operation, which is this, inside, we, we just turn it, bring it out here for illustration purposes, and it's got a management. Those three elements make, are the three elements of a viable system. You have somebody managing an operation, and the operation lets you do things in the environment, and the totality of this is called the viable system because it will adapt, it will learn. And uh, the way the viable system works is that you have uh, a control. This, this management controls the operation through amplification of its own understanding or it filters the variety it's called that comes from the operation and the operation receives, uh, repeats the same formula towards the environment. So that means that you can amplify what you do or you can select to work on certain aspects of a certain problem and not everything. And this is the way you can establish balance. <clears throat> this is the way you can establish balance and get control. It takes much, much longer to explain all the viable system in detail. I just want you to take my word for it, okay? For now, it's just 
we, we can't get into that very much because we wouldn't, it, it, it would take five hours to give you the whole thing, but we're going to do it anyway through our conversation here. The, the foundation of the viable system model is the human nervous system. Uh, it's got all these operations and those are controlled by a brain and then this got translated into this sort of description and so let's go into the the, uh, uh, the basic uh, um, viable system we are interested in which is the person with his brain and the environment. These are the three same elements that make up a viable system. Very simple. We are all viable systems, but it's not just us, the physical body. It's, it's my mind controlling my body and my body controlling part of my environment. So to, to become a viable system, that includes uh, a lot of the things that surround me, that make me viable in, in society. Uh, in, the, in, in Rome, we get the first uh, example of the Roman law using the exact equivalent of the three elements of the Bible system to define a legal person. The pater familias was the owner of the Bible system of his household and he owned his wife and his children and his horses and his the rest of the animals or and the plot of land and, and uh, sorry we see then that the bible system has these three elements this is the management or mental system the system the environment and uh, if you go to law a legal person is the physical entity with a capacity to to reason and his property. That makes you you for the law. It, it's you plus what you own. And uh, in the Roman the Roman citizen is exactly the same three elements. And then if you go to theory of the state, which we give a lot of importance to sometimes. You have a, a government, a population, and a territory. That is a classical definition that you will find over and over and over. There's tens of thousands of books talking about the theory of the state. So there's this important correspondence. And another thing. When uh, we talk about the political person, the first to vote were people that had property. If you didn't have any property, you can vote. So there is this affinity between what the DSM discovers, the Stafford discovers as an invariance in nature, and what the legal system and the theory of the state have discovered in hundreds of years of evolution of legal and uh, thinking of th political thinking. It's, it's the same thing. So now we are going to build the cybernetic state using this basic three element model over and over again. The next stage uh, to build the viable system model is called System 2. And it is a system that Stafford describes as a system that uh, provides some sort of agreement between intervening parts. Okay? System 2 has to do with contracts, has to do with standards, has to do with you drive on the left side of the road 
or you drive on the right side, but everybody does the same thing. You can do it one way in England, another way in Mexico or in the United States, but the important is not the how you decide it, but that everybody shares the same agreement. So here you 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 will see that you can have several entities, several viable entities with their environments overlapping because they are doing some sort of business. And the system two would be a, a, a communication channel that links them together. And so everybody can agree on what they're exchanging or doing. And, and that, in a sense, is nothing else but uh, a for example, a, a market arrangement will, will, will do that. When you have uh, weights and measures, you are also agreeing on, on a standard. If you have uh, money, it, it's also a, a standard that they're, we're sharing. Okay? Uh, now, the classical way of looking at an economy was through the uh, Newtonian view of the universe, where everything is mechanical, and everything can be predicted, and that is not the cybernetic approach. Uh, the assumptions of economies are please, please show here. the assumptions of the Newtonian economy is for instance, that nature is bountiful, that the earth is, is exploitable, that the <coughs> scarcity and choice are the, are the foremost economic problem, problems, that la land, labor, and capital are only inputs of the production process, that to coordinate an economy, all you need uh, is specialization, division of labor, and exchange, and that there is such a thing as perfect competition, and uh, that what you want from an economy is that to grow forever, and that economic agents are, have perfect information. These are assumptions that have worked for many, many years. They're still being taught in schools, at least in some. And uh, the, the, this is not how we would build the cybernetic state. The cybernetic state is built on a, a very different perspective. Here are some examples. The, the Earth is not limitless. It's We are riding on the spaceship Earth. Uh, things don't go smooth and in, in a straight line forever. There's catastrophic change. And scarcity is could be relative because we're finding out that the more we know, the less scarce things can be. For instance, energy. There's a lot of energy. It's just that we don't know how to uh, to get it, and and then the the most important is that complexity defeats rationality. There are things that we just cannot uh, anticipate because of the complexity. So cybernetics deals with complexity, and the cybernetic state is is one that uh, takes that in full consideration. The, the cybernetic state that we're gradually starting to build uh, uses, makes good use of information. Now, I must say that in none of the law books that I, that I used in school appear the word information not, not even once. It's, it's not a concept used in, in law at all. And, and I've looked in many, many books of economy, and you won't find the word information. Because it can be used perhaps in the trivial sense of like somebody brought you information, like brought you some news. But information was not defined technically until after or during the Macy Foundation meetings that I was talking about in the beginning, 
when Norway Wiener uh, in the second conference specifies that information is can be defined mathematically using the same formula as entropy with a negative sign. Uh, and uh, he, in that same conference, he sets the route for the future of information by defining it with the idea of the bit, zeros and one, as, as a measure of something being equiprobable of happening or not happening. If you have something that can happen or not happen in exactly the same probability, you can use a zero or a one to, to give you the answer. If, you, if, if there are many more events that can happen, you need more bits of information in order to specify uh, the answer of the possible outcome. That is to say, if I'm going to pick a card out of 52 cards, I cannot do it with a yes or no. But if I use uh, 10 yes or no, then I can get to just one specific card. Uh, Adam Smith uh, used the, t the concept of the invisible hand. And I, 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 I show here because we're still moving forward, just beginning to move forward in the construction of the viable system model and of the state at the same time. And I, I, I show him because in the, in the idea of the, of the uh, invisible hand, the assumption is that markets tend to balance themselves. Uh, they, they, they can create stability on their own. And, uh, This is, this, is a, this is a market, and this is a market, and what is a market? Is it, is it a place? No, it's not a place. The market are the people that participate in the market. That is the market. And we have this extraordinarily complex global economy which as everybody now realizes, is very difficult to forecast in any considerable detail. You can read here the surprise Mr. Greenspan had. This is the same in, the, in front of the Congress of the United States when everything blew up and the market collapsed and everything. We, he says, We're, we have trusted this thing for 40 years and it didn't work. So the point I want to make is that people will talk about a market economy and the cybernetic state thinking says there cannot be a market economy. Markets do not describe the whole of an economy. The market is just the beginning foundation of a structure that needs many more levels of control to create a viable system and to create the state. The market idea is, is incomplete for control and it was proven dramatically with the collapse of the financial system uh, in the United States and all over the world. Cybernetic state, state, step by step. So we have, we can have this represent people, many, you know, this is just an example, or companies, or people and companies, and they can be exchanging and making deals and working fine. But soon the merchants in Venice discovered that the uh, Sometimes the agreements were not clear enough or somebody was trying to, to get an advantage and no matter how specific your contract could be, you needed somebody to decide controversies between these 
parties right here. So that creates another, that needs another organ of regulation, which we can call the minimal state or the police state, where you need somebody to decide a conflict resolution and uh, authoritarian states, governments have worked with this solution here because they can impose by force and, and that's it. You are a subject and you cannot do anything about it. So once you have an authority that can command, can say, this is what's right, this is what we need, uh, you get many different, different definitions of law. Here are some. Uh, law is a command backed with a threatened sanction issuing from a political superior. The law is what officials do about disputes. That's what the law is itself. Or every law belongs to a legal system. A theory of a legal system is a prerequisite of any adequate definition of a law. This is Joseph Ross. He's a very eminent jurist. And uh, every jurist you read will give you a different definition. And I am reminding, I am reminded of the of the description of the elephant by the guy touching one part and saying, "This is, looks like a trunk of a tree or whatever." So, if, if we analyze each of these decisions, we would find that they are talking about one specific part of the whole viable system called the cybernetic state, just one part. Lawyers have had a hard time identifying the whole system. The more modern go to this type of definition. No, no, you cannot define law if you don't have the system against to which you are comparing. Okay? But it took ages for this for this to become this. Okay? Many, many years of this discussions. Now this, is a, this indicates a channel that I call the justice channel because people who are not having troubles here can, could send information to the superior and say, listen, this guy gave me a raw deal and I need justice. So there's another communication channel. This is shown going up. It could be coming down and looking into what's happening here. and. Uh, and, and this more or less, uh, we, can, we can keep on building the model with this. Now, instead of the definition of, of law that I, that I show you with a different jurist, I think that we can now say that you don't get very far to say law is a system of rules, law is uh, a normative, um, order of some sort. What is law in essence? And nobody in the in, in the legal profession or in the legal schools or law schools will say that law is information. It's very basic, but that's what it is. And this law is a law that seeks seeks requisite variety, which means that it tries to control and create an equilibrium. That law is recursive. It means that you apply the same principles of law many times over and over again at very different levels of the organization. You can have constitutional law, you can have civil law, you can have commercial law, you can have, and all of it applies the same basic uh, principles, and this is what the, the Bible system tells you how the structure of every living creature 
is, is, is mappable. It's exactly the same thing. Now I say law has a dual logic, okay, and I have to stop at this point. What, why do, I, what do I mean by a dual logic? It means that laws are built on two kinds of logic, but lawyers are not aware of this going on. The only logic that lawyers are aware is Aristotelian logic, cause and effect logic. Most of the laws, especially let's say criminal laws, is if you do this, then there's this consequence. You did this, therefore you fall into the hypothesis of the law, therefore we are going to apply the consequence. But there is another important logic which is circular logic, which is the logic of cybernetics, which is the logic of solving a problem not through direct cause-effect, but solving a problem through continuous approximation. Come in. You, you solve a problem through continuous approximation to the solution. If I want to pick, there's a chair here if you want, or over there. If I'm going to pick this from the table, I am using a circular logic. It looks cost effective. I, I, if I do this, I'll get this result. But my brain is calculating the trajectory of my hand over and over many times and pulling back memories as, I, as I'm doing this. I have a model of what's going on in my head and that model has to interact with this reality and it, it does so by making a loop over and over and over and now it, it can look very, very smooth because I have learned to do this repeatedly. But the logic is very different. Is there any lawyers here, by chance? No? No lawyers? Too bad. <laughs> Just me. Well, I, 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 I've asked uh, many, many colleagues, do you know that law uses circular logic? So what are you talking about? Well, there is a, a very plain example of how circular logic is applied. And we'll get to that. Uh, it's going to be a surprise. And the other uh, uh, attribute of law is that it's a metasystemic set of rules in the sense that it is a, it is a, a, a set of rules that controls many other sets of rules of lesser hierarchy. Okay? So I would say that these five descriptions of law tell you more about what the law is than all the definitions ever put together of what law is about. If you say a system of norms, a system of rules, it doesn't, doesn't tell you that much as the information you need to create, to organize a living system called the state and organize the people living in the state and control or regulate their activities. So it's very, very, uh, uh, has a very, very wide scope. Now, if you study Stafford's ideas on the cybernetics, on cybernetics and the management cybernetics and the Bible system model, you need a whole bunch of concepts to, that are appropriate to create this language to explain how living things work. And one of the, let's say, catchy or difficult concepts is self-reference. And here we have it 
in the Constitution of the United States. When they write, we the people, well, not all, not everybody signed there. You'll find John Hancock's uh, signature, which is the most visible, and, and you'll see Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and Jefferson and Adams and the other uh, items and you know, but uh, part of the problem that the law has is that it has needed the concept of self-reference and it has had to work without it and then you get all these, that's a mystery, oh that's a fiction, it's a legal fiction, it's, there's no fiction. We use, we in law use the term legal fiction. When we talk about the corporation, we say corporations are legal fictions. Oh wow. There's nothing fiction. There's nothing, uh, there's no fiction of, uh, of a corporation because from the cybernetic standpoint, it has exactly the same attributes that a physical person has. It has the communication connections, just as a physical person. The fact is, we have no way of creating organizations that are very far away from what we, the way we ourselves are built. So we don't need fictions. We need perhaps other concepts to explain. And so you have this enormous body of cybernetics called management cybernetics that will explain the law better than the lawyers have been able to do up to now. Now, the not so good news about this is that I wrote this book 17 years ago. And this is the first <coughs> time that I explained it to a crowd of this quality and in such a distinguished place. So if we take Stafford Beer's management cybernetics, his concepts, and we look at them carefully and we study them, then it's very easy to see how, for instance, the American Constitution, which is an explicit constitution, it's a written constitution, we can see all the, the parts in there. The, for instance, the equilibrium of powers between the executive, the judiciary branch, and the legislative. It, in the Constitution, the founding fathers made sure that there's a balance so that they, they talk about checks and balances because it was built on the assumption that people are not very trustworthy and that these new organs of the state needed the power of one to control the power of another and another and it goes into circles and they created a system that has been very resilient and very uh, uh, has withstood the, the, the um, test of time and in the United Kingdom well you have your own constitution which is not explicit it's not written but I'm sure you will find many, many uh, homestats operating. By homestat, I mean a channel, a, a channel where information is exchanged and it goes round and round until it gets it right and it's adjusting itself all the time. Stuff called government and a system of self-vetoing homeostats. That is a system where you have many people participating and they are balancing their activities one against the other all the time and, and adjusting their behavior according to the interactions with the other, with the other people. So this cybernetic state uses the management cybernetics insights to describe or describe again what 
lawyers or attorneys or politicians created through trial and error, and you can now do it, let's say, on purpose. You can redesign the system and you can uh, map what you have and you can technically say this is not very good, this could be better because we know a lot more of how to do these things now <coughs> than what the founding fathers did 230 years ago or what evolved in the United Kingdom along what, 600 years, 1,000 years perhaps, since the Carta Magna, 800 years ago, right? So, uh, we go now to the, the idea of the circular uh, mo mode of law, and we have another element of the cybernetic state we are adding. We have system ones here, the beginning, the foundation, then the coordination with the contract laws, uh, the um, standards, adoption of standards and whatever, you have an authority, and now we have another component here with stuffer names simply systems one, two, three, four, but this gets to be, uh, if, if this is an executive, this is a planner. You're starting to, to realize that you need to think ahead of what you're doing, and we can also call it the model maker. We could call it the planner, we could call it the model maker, we could call it intelligence, we could call it policy, we could call it many things. Uh, but the basic function is that this, this um, <coughs> organ is looking, trying to solve problems in the future. This guy here is solving problems in the present, the here and now. You, and you solve problems uh, that you already know how to solve. You, you're applying solutions. And this other organ is looking towards the future environment described here in this manner. And you are trying to anticipate the future. And this is exactly the role played by the by, by Congress. Okay, it's called the legislative process. You have a Congress, you have new laws here coming in, with a new initiatives that is, then they come out as legislation, they produce the effects on society. Society has certain expectations. It compares what this law created, the effects, against the expectations, and if people don't like it, popular demands would produce new initiatives, and, and, and it is something that goes round and round and round. So here is the solution to the circular logic that lawyers are ignorant about. They, they don't see this. They, they know this, and they practice this, and they live it, and they are in there, but they never see that as being a distinct form of logic, which is circular logic because you are reaching solutions through successive approximation. It's not like, okay, I know how to produce this bottle, and there are millions of bottles like this. Once we know how to do it, we can do it over and over and over again. Every chair, every desk, every lamp is something that we are doing over and over because we know how to do those things. But when it comes to law, you don't know what people want, so you're sort of anticipating or solving problems by guessing what a solution would be. And, and you don't pretend that this legisl legislation is gonna keep uh, being valid forever, but you s sort of solve the problem, and then if you need to, two, three years, 10 years down the road, you will make some adjustment and institutions will tend to stabilize over longer periods of time until internet comes or you invent computers and then everything has to be 
uh, reconsidered. And we are at that stage right now because we are, uh, Trevor here uh, was saying it very clearly uh, uh, yesterday, information, it was very costly to get information. And now we are saturated with information. Maybe this chat will say this one more case of saturation. I hope not. But the truth is, you can get, you can ask Mr. Google any question, and it will probably give you a very acceptable answer. So this is the circular uh, logic that operates in the in the in the state. In the modern democratic state, and uh, it, it, this process has been going on for ages now, lots of centuries. We get now to the fifth and final level of the cybernetic state organization, and this level is called, in legal terms, the sovereign or the the sovereign entity, and in, in um, the language of, of Stafford, it's the identity of the system, is the one in the final command. In a constitutional arrangement, it's el pueblo, like President Allende told Stafford when he showed him the uh, description of the Bible system and Stafford thought that the president was going to say, oh, that's me, I'm in charge. And the president say, oh, you mean the final responsible for everything, you know, the, 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 the one that, that's in command? He said, to President Allende, was, the natural answer was el pueblo, the people. And th that is how modern democracies are, are built. So you have all these layers of control systems and at the very top you have the people. In this case the founding fathers of the United States, they acted as representatives of the people. Okay. So here is a description, a, a, a more uh, detailed description of the Bible system produced by Stafford. Whoops. <laughs> it has a life of its own. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I copy paste it from uh, some other presentation. It's calling from a bad <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I bet you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Now we can talk about this other one. <laughs> so, that very complicated. Uh, description. I can always reverse that and, and show it to you again. So this is the cybernetic state in the, in the most simple description. You have an environment, you have this meta system, which is the manager of two main <coughs> bodies, which is the federal government and state governments inside, and then you would have inside the state, you would have, in, let's say in, in Mexico, you would have municipalities in here, and that's, those are only three levels. Yesterday I was told that in England there are more levels. You have counties, you have precincts, or you have districts, and I think not everybody understands how it's working. It's been evolving a little haphazardly, and I think you will gain a lot if you try to put some order, but I don't think the Queen is going to be very very enthusiastic about it. So the, the thing is that this is this is the big surprise that I received. That Stafford model maps perfectly to what I call now the cybernetic state. Now one in, in the overall picture there is this there is this perfect coincidence. But it is not Cybernetic, the one, the, mod, the the government we have right now is not a perfect example of a cybernetic state or cybernetic model. It's incomplete because 
for instance, the founding fathers of the United States were not too sure about the type of system they were creating. So they, they decided that the executive power was going to mimic the monarch in England and have almost absolute powers. So everybody that who's named to work for the executive can be removed almost immediately. Perhaps there have been a little bit <coughs> of that effect. But what I mean to say is, here you have, at this level, a very <coughs> organic-like government, which is self-vetoing, homeostasis mechanisms, balancing each other out. And then, in the executive power, you have this pyramid, which is a power <coughs> pyramid, a power structure, a hierarchic organization. And maybe the solution for a true cybernetic state was to rearrange things so that everything got to be very organic. And, and, and we would have to sit down and discuss this for <coughs> hours, perhaps. But it, it shows that, there's, that there is a language that can be used now that we make this connection. In 1983, with Stafford, Stafford, do you think this can work? Is it going to be there? Yes, it is. There was. It took me uh, three or four years to write another book I was, I was finishing <coughs> called Cybernetica, Estado de Derecho to Cybernetics, The Law and the State. And I, miss it. I, made, I made a mess of it, and then I rewrote it in the, in the form of Cybernetic State. Went directly to the animal, to the animal we're trying to control. I call it animal because it's, it's an organism. The state is not a legal fiction. It is an animal, an or organism, just as alive as we are. Legal, Even if we want to deny that. A legal entity. It's a legal entity, yes, because the law requires, it, it demands of itself to formalize things in order to be able to see. The state has, be, has to create organs through which the state can see things happening. And that's why you have judges, and you have policemen, and you have uh, uh, prosecutors. Those are organs of the state. Because it has to mimic us in order to do things. But it has to create the rules that build all of that. It is a bit complicated, a bit complex. But we can understand it better if we use this language, and if we use the viable system model, and if we use the concept invented or discovered, call it what you want, by stuff or beer. Now, this slide, I put it here because this is very important that I, that I that I, that I clarify this. To create the cybernetic state, <coughs> we cannot do it if we, let's say, we are the citizens of a country here, we cannot create it if we don't share the same model in our heads. Okay? The model that you brought here today of what the state is, I am sure, is a very different model of the one that you're going to take when you leave this room. Because you came here to learn about the cybernetic state, which is another model, another way of looking at the same organism at the same animal, okay? And I've asked also people, and not, ne not necessarily only lawyers, what is the science of government? And some will say, I don't know, is it economics? Is it the law? Is it political science? And the answer is no. The, the, the science of govern government is cybernetics. That's where the word government comes from. 
from cybernetics. Kubernetes that got transformed into governor, governare, governor, it's, it's the Latin and the Greek, the Greek and the Latin. So, if we were to create a new organization for the state, and we are going to make sure that, that the authority of that state works much better than it, the, the organization of the state works right now, the first thing we would have to do is to make sure that everybody is sharing the same model. Because the laws do not work because they are punishing people, which is a very important part of the definition that we usually hear of what the law is, as one of the definitions that I read. It is the capacity to sanction which makes it legal. It, it, the, the, the law is the law because it is the only one that can sanction, and use the power of the state to sanction somebody and do it, you know, to put you in jail, or execute you and, and nothing happens, okay? So, the law works because we all have the same model. We all think this is the way to act because I expect everybody to act the same way. Otherwise, you would just be waiting for somebody to leave the computer and you take it. No, it, it, the law doesn't work because there's this possibility of, of, of uh, being penalized. It works because we are sharing, we are sharing a same a, a model. We are sharing the same values. We are sharing the, a same mentality. And cybernetically, we're sharing the same maps of how everything works. <coughs> we're just conforming because it is better to do it this way than to go against the grain all the time. If we were to create a, another form of government, this is probably, in my suggestion, the way we should do it. We would have a government that itself is then made up of this, other areas of government where you have energy and you have infrastructure, extraction, transportation, um, distribution, uh, services, re restoration. Those are the uh, usual, uh, those are the functions performed by every living system from the cell onwards. And I think that it would be much better to organize this way than to have elect people to a Congress. You have Congress or Parliament with 300, 400, 500 people, everybody going crazy and, and can't get uh, agree on anything, okay? If you specialize, if you specialize and say, let's get the people which are more knowledgeable in energy and I elect like them. So if I'm good for energy, I say, okay, I'm willing to run, I'm willing to provide my services to the government. And there will be 300 guys that know about energy. And some would even, wouldn't even dare to, to put their name up there because they know they're not competent enough. So then you as a citizen would elect, I'm going to choose who I want to go here, who I want to go here, here and here. And then you would get people which are much better at doing their, their stuff. And these are the natural functions because you, get, you need energy to, get, um, to create infrastructure, to extract energy, to extract uh, materials, to transport them, to transform them to sell them, to consume them, or whatever. Those are the natural functions. They, 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 they are not in conflict with each other, that's what I need to say, okay? 
So I think this would be a much better way to organize the state. Go directly to the function because we know what they are. Okay? We know these cannot go away. And then in the method system we would have communications and you would have elections and you would have in the box, the blue box on top, you would have <coughs> all those processing things up here, but you would have the basic uh, energy, food production, uh, uh, transformation, all of that in the in the operation part of the of the system. So that's basically the cybernetic state. It's 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 uh, a new way to discuss, to describe the organization that uh, we would uh, use to make life easier for everybody. Right now, the modern democratic state, I think, is in the great crisis. All the idea of the representative democracy is not working. It's not working here, it's not working in the United States, it's not working in Mexico, it's not working, certainly not in Egypt, they don't have a system right now. Uh, but I think it doesn't work because we are electing people with too much power. You send them to be part of parliament or part of congress that doesn't have a specific agenda. So then they, they will use that extra power that they got to negotiate and not necessarily for those being represented. And there are so many interests and so much lobbying and so, so many things trying to make it work for somebody and not for somebody else, that it, it gets to be a very messy and difficult uh, process, a, a very different, difficult way to manage things and to get, to get agreements. So, well, uh, I hope you consider this as a possibility some, sometime. Large systems tend to be very stable and they have many redundancies built in and they, they resist change a lot. It, 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 perhaps it's going to take a much larger crisis than the one we're in to get people to think of doing it a different way, but this could be a different way. And if we did, one of the advantages is that the state can be modeled exactly the same way as any business enterprise and you could you could work on the description of the state in many many levels you go to let me go back a little bit you, you go back to energy you can say okay what types of, of energy we have well we have atomic we have uh, thermal <coughs> thermal energy we have uh, hydroelectric energy or we have air, the wind energy and then each one of those would further uh, break down into ter territories or areas and you could create a, a strategy to say we are going to phase out atomic energy in the next 20 years and since you have the guys that are mo most knowledgeable of this it's more, it's easier that they would work it out than, than having congressmen being influenced by the lobbies and trying to make it difficult to get any sort of agreement. So then we problems tend to perpetuate themselves for much longer time than needed. So we have to share a model, a new model. What? Oh, it, it's going to take time. <laughs> <laughs> it won't let me do anything. It's going to do it sometime. <laughs>